Thank you for joining us for this webinar presented by the Living New Deal. We are recording this webinar and it will be shared afterwards on our YouTube page. You can also find us live on Facebook. If you have any questions during this webinar, please ask them in the Q&A section. Now handing it over to Kurt. Welcome everyone to tonight's Living New Deal webinar, Living in the Future, a discussion of interracial utopian activist movements that preceded and coincided with the New Deal, inspired many of its programs, and shaped the civil rights movement. I'm Kurt Feichmeyer, your host. For those of you new to the Living New Deal, we're a nonprofit organization founded at UC Berkeley about 18 years ago. Our mission is to preserve the New Deal legacy nationwide, to raise awareness of what the New Deal was and did, and to pro promote the New Deal as a model for good governance today. You can learn about the New Deal's legacy and its pivotal role in the nation's recovery from the Great Depression. Search thousands of New Deal sites that our team has documented on our interactive map and freely access many educational resources, all on our website, livingnewdeal.org. Tonight, we're honored to present Victoria Wolcott, winner of the 2022 New Deal Book Award. The Living New Deal established the New Deal Book Award in 2021 to recognize and encourage nonfiction works about the New Deal era, 1933 to 1942, that remarkable decade between the Great Depression and the U.S.'s entry into World War II. We're still accepting nominations for the 2023 award until November 15th. Victoria Wolcott is professor of history at Buffalo University and director of the university's Gender Institute. She will be talking about her book, her award-winning book, I should say, Living in the Future, Utopianism and the Long Civil Rights Movement, together with Kimberly Johnson, New York University Professor of Social and Cultural Analysis, Chair of the New Deal Book Award Review Committee, and a research advisor to the Living New Deal Project. I should mention that Victoria's uh, Living in the Future is published by the University of Chicago Press. During our year-end fundraising appeal starting next month, higher level donors will receive a complimentary copy of her book as a thank you gift. Now on to the presentation. We like our webinars to be interactive, so please do join the conversation. Write your questions into the Q&A and our presenters will answer them at the end of the program. I'm delighted to introduce these distinguished scholars to the Living New Deal webinar stage. Victoria and Kimberly, welcome. Thank you so much, Kurt, for that. I really appreciate it. And um, just thank you so much for inviting me to do this today. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for helping out with today's event, and particularly thank you to Kimberly Johnson for agreeing to do this today as well. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my work with you. Um, I'm going to start by just doing a little summary overview of the book for those of you who are unfamiliar, and then hand things over to my co-presenter, um, Kimberly, for some Q&A between us before opening up to the audience. Um, so Elizabeth, maybe could you share the screen of the slideshow? I was unable to share my screen, so I'm going to have to ask her to do it for me. Uh, but basically, this book is an overview of utopian communities and groups from roughly the 1920s through the early 1950s, but really focused more on that New Deal era um, that look at the ways in which utopian ideas and practices influence these various groups. And basically, what I want to do is talk about the three major categories that tie these different examples together. And then in our conversation, we can go into any of them in more depth that people would like to. Um, next slide, please. But I just want to start off briefly with a, a definition of utopia. Uh, this, is, this term, of course, comes from the 1516 Sir Thomas More, a book of that uh, title. Um, and it comes from the Greek word for good place or eutopia. And then what Moore does is he brings a U in there for utopia, which means no place. So from its very inception, utopias have been considered 
fantastical or out of reach or a waste of time. But actually, if you think about it um, in terms of the, the kind of definitions that I use, it's also very much about imagination. So these two definitions, one from one of the leading scholars of utopia, who talks about this idea of social dreaming that allows communities to envision a radically different society than one in which the dreamers live. And the second defini definition from um, the historian Robert Kelly, who writes about sort of radical social movements and says that I have come to realize that once we strip radical movements down to their bare essence and understand the collective desires of people in motion, uh, freedom and love lay at the very heart of the matter. Um, so we can go to the next slide. I think the other sort of term that might be helpful here as well is that some people might be familiar with is the term prefigurative politics, which comes really from sociology and political science. Uh, and the, the uh, political scientist Carl Boggs defined this as the embodiment within the ongoing political practice of a movement of those forms of social relations, decision making, culture, and human experience that are the ultimate goal. It's basically trying to honor the means over the ends, that is, trying to live the actual future that you are trying to envision. So, all the groups and people that I study very much are engaged in this. Uh, so my first category is the category of interracialism. I realize there's a lot of text on the screen. I'll just go through it very briefly. But when I first started thinking about interracialism, I realized that I needed to break it down into these different categories because it's a pretty complex term and kind of complex social idea. So this first category is what I'm calling liberal interracialism, which is essentially interracial mixing among educated elites that provide a crucial intellectual and physical space to discuss racial equality. Uh, it's really about education. It's about moral suasion. A lot of these spaces, like the YMCA's and YWCA's, for example, um, the fellowship houses, which I'll talk briefly about as well, they offer a physical space for elites often or middle class people to come together and have these conversations, but they usually stop short of kind of more dramatic changes. Labor interracialism will be uh, more familiar for those of you who are sort of engaged in New Deal history, certainly. These are class-based movements to create strategic alliances across racial lines. Um, they're first generated by progressive unions such as the ILGWU or the Interla uh, International Ladies Garment Workers Union, and then also propagated really and came to a height during the 1930s with the Congress of Industrial Organizations. Um, they also encompass this really interesting movement called the Workers' Education Movement. And let me just give you a quick quote about this. This is from Fania Khan, the Jewish labor organizer uh, who really was cent central to this movement in the 19-teens and 20s. And she said, it has always been our conviction that the labor movement stands consciously or unconsciously for the reconstruction of society. It strives toward a new life. It dreams of a world where economic and social justice will prevail, where the welfare of mankind will be the aim of all activity, where society will be organized as a cooperative commonwealth. And you can see how the CIO very much kind of comes out of these sorts of ideas of labor uh, interracialism as well. The third category here is utopian interrac interracialism. Um, one of the main uh, groups that I look at in terms of this particular idea is the Father Divine's Peace Mission. But this is an ideology or a set of practices that both envisions and lives a future of full racial equality and brotherhood, that they're taking these ideas of interracialism to really sort of their ultimate ends. And I would argue, argue that the early uh, Congress of Racial Equality in the 1940s and then later SNCC as well into the 1960s also calls together this kind of category. Uh, next slide, please. So the next kind of, the second sort of major category that ties all the groups together is uh, the idea of nonviolence. And here I'm not talking so much about the kind of peace churches like the Quakers or the Mennonites, but specifically the application of a nonviolent direct action taken from Gandhi into the American um, context, the, the transmission of Gandhian ideas and practice to the American pro uh, context. And this happens quite early. Uh, Black newspapers in the 1920s um, 
were already covering Gandhi's movement in 1929, as you see here. W.E.B. Du Bois invited Gandhi to publish a message in Crisis Magazine with an introduction that called him, quote, the greatest colored man in the world, unquote. Uh, and in the short message, Gandhi told black leaders that, quote, let us realize the future is with those who would be truthful, pure, and loving. Uh, next slide. One of the most uh, important figures that brings Gandhi to the US context is the theologian, the African-American theologian, Howard Thurmer, Thurman, rather, who kind of comes out of liberal interracialism. Um, the YMCA student Christian movement brings him and his wife, Sue Bailey Thurman, to South Asia, where he is the first, he and his wife are the first, uh, along with another couple actually, the first African Americans to meet with Gandhi. Um, and part of that conversation, Gandhi said, quote, it may be through the Negroes that the undulterated message of nonviolence will be delivered to this world. Uh, next slide, please. So Thurman brings this idea um, back to the US and it's really propagated through these fellowship houses, which again, I'm happy to talk more about as well as the Fellowship Church of All Peoples, which he uh, creates and establishes in San Francisco um, in the early 1940s as well. And it's actually in this the Philadelphia Fellowship House uh, that you have the introduction of these nonviolent direct action ideas and Gandhian ideas to, in fact, uh, Martin Luther King. So Martin Luther King's introduction to Gandhi was in uh, 1950 in the Fellowship House in Philadelphia through a speech by Mordecai Johnson, the president of Howard University. And King later writes, his message was so profound and electrifying that I left the meeting and bought a half dozen books on Gandhi's life and work. Next slide. Uh, another important sort of influence in thinking about this getting into the 1940s is the Congress of Racial Equality, which takes these ideas and starts to actually apply them on the ground in very dramatic uh, cases, particularly throughout the Midwest and the Northeast. And you can see here Bayard Rustin and George Hauser in that particular picture. Um, and again, this is when the civil rights movement is really beginning to pick up steam as a result of all these interactions that I kind of talk about in the book. Next slide. You know, and the third category uh, of these, you know, there's interracialism, there's nonviolence. The third category is cooperatives. And this particularly is profoundly important during the New Deal era because of the incredible disruption of the Great Depression, where you have thinkers, intellectuals, as well as ordinary people and working people looking for alternatives to capitalism. Um, that's certainly true in the case of the Father Divine movement. Um, it's true in terms of workers' education in places like the Berkwood Labor College. College and the Delta and Providence cooperative farms. And in fact, the cooperative movement becomes an absolutely central to sort of utopian thought and practice throughout this era. So finally, my work se seeks to trace a common thread through multiple organizations and practices that have been largely overlooked in the current historiography in the long civil rights movement and to some extent in the New Deal history as well. Um, it's a thread that might be a little bit different than some people's you know, assumptions about the era. But the activists trained by CORE in fellowship houses and elsewhere went on to train SNCC activists and anti-war protesters during the 1960s. And by living in the future, they helped enact that future, however imperfect. Um, so I'll leave my little summary at that. But again, happy to delve into any pieces of this that people are interested in. Kimberly? Hey, uh, sorry, I thought mm -hmm. Kurt was going to jump in, but I'll jump in. Okay. Okay, so thank you so much. I thought, you know, when we uh, read it, uh, as the, when the committee read your book, we just were stunned by the, the sort of breadth of the different groups that you covered and the way in which you can't help but rethink the sort of civil rights movement, the sort of 1960s really without thinking about, as you said, the sort of prefigurative politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, there are a couple of questions I had. One is sort of more like a kind of more of an academic question, which is um, I'm always fascinated by how people kind of come to their topic 
and how they bring the sort of different people and voices that they look at together. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you could just tell a little bit about your sort of process, how you came to this project. Um, and then I think also maybe if you could just say like, what, what's something that you really wish thought was super interesting, but didn't actually make it into the book? Oh, that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the way I came into this was from my second book. I wrote a book called Race, Riots, and Roller Coasters, The Struggle Against Segregated Edu uh, Recreation. So it was about the history of recreation in the 20th century and the civil rights struggles to open up those places of recreation, roller skating rinks, swimming pools, amusement parks, um, to African Americans specifically. And when I was researching that project, um, I kept coming across when I got to like the late 30s and the 90, early 1940s, like early 1940s, I kept coming across these groups that were like living in ashrams and living in, in communes and in peace cells, they're radical pacifist, um, who were using nonviolent direct action tactics like really early, specifically to address these forms of recreation. And I had never read about these folks before. I, I hadn't really encountered them before. Um, I, I, one of the areas that I'm now much more, you know, up to speed on, uh, but the whole area of peace studies, right, was not something that interacted with civil rights historiography as much as I think it should. Um, so I was just re super curious about who were these people? Uh, why were they? Why were they so engaged in this form of nonviolent direct action? Why were they living in these communities? And that was the that was the kind of what got me into what are some other, okay, I start to find out more about them. They're sort of the predecessors to the Congress of Racial Equality and of course, CORE itself. Um, and then what are the connections between other kinds of, you know, movements and ideas um, that, uh, that could, you know, put together a larger narrative. So those were the kinds of threads that I was pulling, but that's sort of, that was really uh, in many ways, the origins. I have to say, you know, uh, in, that you know, doing this work too, being a historian, um, and particularly writing that that second book, uh, you know, it's really difficult struggling constantly with the level of racial violence, um, the the sort of the the, uh, the racial apartheid, et cetera, of the 20th century. And there was something about the sort of hopefulness, right, of the the sort of vision of this future, the 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 sense of some optimism, some hopefulness still based in pragmatism that I also found really attractive. Um, in terms of what I'd like to write more about, I really, I really did a deep dive into like the early kind of workers education movement, which has not been written about much since like the 1970s and 1980s when labor history was all the, the rage. <laughs> Um, and going back and looking at that, and it, it is in the first chapter of the book, um, but it's a relatively short, you know, section of the overall book. And I just found this workers' education movement that um, starts in the 19 teens, really, as part of the connection between feminism and labor, um, and really envisions a a world in which workers are are honored not only for organizing good unions and being good rank and file workers and organizers, but also their whole lives. So they did things like created these like unity houses um, mm -hmm. in cities where working people could come together. And these were interracial, um, deliberately so, and and like have rest <laughs> and listen to music and dance. And they, were, they had a resort in the Catskills, which was a unity resort. Um, and I just, that, that to me just was such a, a a really powerful vision. And again, it, it is in the book, but I, you know, that could be a whole book onto itself. And I wish mm -hmm. like, I wish all service workers could have like a unity house that they could go to in the weekends. So thanks. Actually, that brings me into um, a question I was going to ask later, but I think this is maybe a good point for it is um, you talked about these unity houses and I was, I was, as I was, as I read the book, I was thinking about in some ways, it's very brave of sort of an average person to sort of step away from their everyday life and like live in a utopia or attempt to create a utopia. Um, and I'm sort of curious about if you got any sense of their thinking um, about it and the struggles about it, um, about this kind of moved into, I'm going to move upstate New York, I'm going to move to this 
uh, yeah. uh, this farmer and then it worked for the unity house or, or what, what have you. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it really varies by your positionality. Um, so if you're a kind of more elite intellectual sort of socialist, like somebody like the white um, minister Sherwood Eddy, or the actually also a minister AJ Musty, you know, sort of the white leader of the uh, the Fellowship of Reconciliation. That's much more of a cerebral kind of ideological move that you're making, um, thinking about both creating these communities and maybe living in community. I think for uh, if you think about the sharecroppers, you know, certainly, you know, in 1936, who are being ripped from their homes and literally left on the side of the street. And Sherwood actually, Eddie actually comes along and says, look, we're starting this new cooperative farm in Mississippi. Um, then your motivations are going to be are going to be different, but they might still have some idealism and some some ideology as well, you know, wrapped in there. Similarly, with some of the followers of Father Divine, you know, there's a variety of motivations. So it sort of depends on your positionality. Um, mm -hmm. And and then there's you know sort of cross sections. I mean, a lot of the African American activists. Um, you know, people like Ella Baker and Polly Murray, who are, I want to say their household names, I hope their household names, um, you know, they don't have much money. It's not like they're, they're, you know, sort of elite leaders and that, you know, during the late 20s and early 30s when and, and we're late 30s, really, when they're, um, or actually, yeah, late 20s, early 30s, when they go to Brookwood Labor College, and they start getting involved in the movement. So they have a, a kind of a very, I think, vibrant combination of experiences that brings them to these movements. So it, it varies, but it's an important question. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess probably following on that, and this is um, a question that I was posted in the chat, but um, I thought was kind of also an interesting question, um, is thinking about kind of utopia. Um, and um, I think one of the things when I when I when I met with you earlier, um, I think often because of the 70s, and just blame it on the 70s, um, we often think of utopias or utopian movements as as not necessarily fantastic sort of liberating things, but often kind of dark and um yeah uh, dangerous. And so I am actually thinking about um, Jim Jones and the People's Temple, um, and right. so when I was reading about you know, the various groups in your book, I I, I kind of couldn't help but think about this too as in a, in a way a utopian um, movement that went down into a very sort of sad and 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 deadly way. And so I'm just thinking about what is it? I guess what is it that I guess what what are sort of recent utopian movements, um, and do we not and do we know that they're a utopian movement at the moment that they're happening, or it's only in retrospect that we realize oh that was a prefigurative kind of a prefigurative politics? Yeah, it's a yeah it's it gets complicated. It's sort of the cult question, which I get from my undergraduates a lot when I teach it. You know, I teach I didn't a seminar. Want to use that word. Utopia. <laughs> no, I really appreciate that you're not using that because it's a very loaded word. Um, and and the Jim Jones example is particularly uh, difficult because um, he is was a charismatic you know evangelical leader who directly uh, was influenced by the Father Divine Movement, created um, a community, a, a, a overtly interracial community of mostly working class people that, you know, preached a kind of socialism, right? A kind of, you know, communal living, anti-capitalism that was, I think, very attractive to progressives in in the late 60s and early 70s and he actually pulled some of father divine's followers father divine had had already passed away um in the early 70s into his movement and then of course you know he becomes this this despotic leader and leads to the death of um, hundreds of people, including including many many children. So, absolutely horrific. Um, so, so there are you know sociologists who look at the stuff. You know, they do talk about particularly particular kind of warning signs in some ways, mm -hmm. right? It, like when these movements can start to become 
autocratic, despotic, um, people are cut off from, you know, family members, et cetera. So there's ways to kind of think about that, engage that. Um, and there, and at the same time that that was a real thing, that, a horrific thing that happened, there was also a kind of hysteria in the 1970s too about, about you know, the, the problems of these kinds of movements. So that's a more complicated history. Um, in, in the broader kind of 20th century history, uh, there's also a discrediting and the sort of broad way of utopian ideas because of World War II and the Cold War. So, so Cold War intellectual, Cold War liberals were very anti-utopian for that reason as well. So that it had a lot, a lot going against it. Um, in the second half of the 20th century, um, that's certainly the case. Yeah. I don't know if I fully answered your question, but. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I think that, uh, I think that, you know, I think we are living in a world, I think, with lots of challenges to, uh, and lots of things going on. I think there's a, a kind of a yearning for at least a new kind of politics, um, and certainly I think a yearning for utopia. And, um. I'm sort of curious about, is there something, I mean, to kind of bring us back to the New Deal, was there something that you think was particularly kind of in the air, um, whether we're talking about the late 20s or particularly during the 1930s, that kind of allowed for this kind of flourishing of these utopian movements? I mean, I think a lot of it was the absolute desperation and crisis of the Great Depression and a seeking for, just thinking about economics, right, a seeking for an alternative to a, a form of capitalism that clearly was not serving people to say the least. Um, so that, you know, coming together in community where you're growing your own food, um, where you're, you know, sharing childcare, where you're, you know, engaging in kind of a communal economics made a lot of pragmatic sense. There was a lot of that going on that wasn't part of these groups that I'm talking about. Um, so certainly, a kind of uh, broader acceptance of socialism, of cooperative economic, I mean, the, the, the ways in which cooperatives exploded during the 1930s and 40s is really extraordinary, particularly in African American communities and cities like the city of Buffalo had a thriving cooperative, like grocery store, they had, I think they had a roller skating rink as well. And, you know, various other things, right, o owned cooperatively uh, within the community and shared. Um, that worked really effectively during the Great Depression, where you're, you know, there wasn't enough to go around. So I think the crisis of the Great Depression um, was a huge part of that. Um, certainly for for many people, and just that kind of just break, uh, that sense of crisis, that break opens up the possibility of new ideas. Um, I think you saw that a little bit. You know, with Occupy Wall Street in the 2008 recession, I think you've seen it in some other movements more recently as well. Um, but you certainly saw it during the experimentation of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, there's actually a couple of questions in the chat that okay. is echoing um, a question that I had, which is, you know, you really focus a lot on interracialism. And as you were talking about the sort of research process, you know, having to sort of find these moments of connection within a wider backdrop of this sort of Jim Crow apartheid uh, uh, century that uh, that these folks were embedded in. And I think that I'm, I'm curious about, again, like what enables, I mean, you talk about desperation, but desperation can also lead to sort of more negative things. But what sure. what is happening that there's this moment where people consciously and really, I think, in very tough situations, um, reach outside of themselves to connect with people who are different from themselves. I think a lot of that has to do with religion. Um, a lot of these movements, when you think about the Fellowship of Reconciliation, when you think about the Congress of, of Racial Equality, um, they, these, are, these are groups, when you think about actually the Delta Cooperative Farm and Sherwood Eddy, these are all groups that are part of what would be called the Christian left, very broadly. Mm -hmm. um, Howard Thurman, of course, incredibly important. 
Uh, so they're often ecumenical, you know, in the case of Thurman or many of them, you know, somebody like Bayard, you know, Rustin coming and, and, and George Hauser, the core people coming from Methodist and Quaker backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So that Christian left tradition is really, really important. And I know in religious history, there's been more work um, done on this. Uh, my colleague, June Zubovich has a really good book on this. And there's mm -hmm. some others as well. Um, so the kind of Christian left, along with also um, radical pacifism, uh, which is calling for sort of the unity of mankind or humankind, they would probably say mankind, um, but, but, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that's actually, it's not even just US, right? It's, it's more, it's more global than that. So there is a, a kind of interwar ecumenical Christian mm -hmm. left global movement going on um, around radical pacifism. Um, so that's that's a sort of that's a really, really important strand um, of it. Um, but I also think there's a deep grassroots tradition, uh, and I'm not a historian of the South, but I was writing about Mississippi and have been learning much more. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, from the populist movement um, and from the movements in the 20s, labor movements in the South, there was really powerful interracial organizing uh, going on in the South, you know, in the 1880s and 1890s into the 1920s, prior to you know CPUSA showing up or or the Socialist Party showing up, um, mm -hmm. and those traditions of interracial organizing, which are often which is religiously inflected as well. Uh, should need to be recognized as well. There's also, of course, a really important Black nationalist tradition, which I only touch on at the very end of the book. You could write mm -hmm. an entire another book easily or right, right. anymore, right? Um, uh, I've written a little bit about this in articles about the Black uh, cooperative tradition, um, but there's also, that's another kind of response, which you can see as well. So I guess, thank you so much. Um, to even go further back, I mean, one could almost say that much of what you touched on in terms of thinking about the sort of cooperative movements and communitarianism, we sort of can see and say someone like Tocqueville. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm curious about, is there something that you feel is particularly American about this that you might not see in other, other places? I mean, there really, there is. There is. I mean, going back to go back to the 18th century and um, and the antebellum period, um, thinking about groups like the Shakers and Anita um, and these er various other utopian groups. There is a whole group of German or the Germany didn't exist at that point, but the sort of Central European Pietists who come over and they form a bunch of utopian communities in places like, you know, Western Pennsylvania, which is considered the frontier. Um, Pennsylvania in particular, of course, is very open to new religious groups. Uh, so there was a sense in which this was a space in which, you know, Robert Owen comes over from Scotland and forms a mm -hmm. utopian community. Um, most of these communities don't last that long. Others like the Shakers and actually Oneida as well do quite well. Uh, so that tradition is, is, is definitely, you know, part of a broader American tradition. It happens in other places. Um, but this is a this is a a place in which there there's more land available. Um, there's often more economic opportunity available um, as well. Um, and this does play a role also in African American history. If you think about Sojourner Truth, uh, mm -hmm. after she gained her freedom, she basically traveled from one utopian community to another to mm -hmm. to do her speech, you know, her political work, um, but also to survive and to live. So. There's, and there's also after, you know, after emancipation um, formation of these communities. So, so it is, it's not, it's not only American, um, but it's a strong American tradition. And I always try to think mm -hmm. about, when we think about American society, we think about individualism and, you know, competition, but there's a parallel narrative, which is about communalism. Um, mm -hmm. And that just gets drowned out. Um, and then there's these sort of off, you know, moments of crisis where we, we can kind of rediscover that tradition. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to just ask a couple more questions and then we'll kind of open it up to the audience. But um, I think, I'm, you know, I think what I found, I think, sort of striking about the book is the sense of possibility, right? Again, thinking about what, what's happening today. And I think um, what, probably a couple of interrelated questions, what... Um, what are the sort of utopian 
impulses that you can see today. And you mentioned a little bit of one of them in, in, at the end of your book, um, but maybe if you can want to expand on that. Um, and um, I think the other question would be is, I know that my students and my kids um, mm. spend a lot of time online. Um, and so can we imagine that perhaps online spaces are the sort of third spaces in which one can commu create community um, or really is it just you need that sort of tactile kind of physical relationship to make utopia a thing? Yeah, that's a great question. And my students and I debate this all the time. And they're actually pretty skeptical about the ability to, to use online spaces oh. in some ways, although not always. But um, yeah, so I, I would see this on sort of different scales. Um, I think there is definitely a resurgence of interest in creating kind of small, and I'm just going to use the word sort of anarchist or anarcho-syndicalist. Um, and I should say a lot of the groups I study you know, um, very much identify in that way as well, kind of small scale communal living situations in cities like Detroit and, and Buffalo, you know, where I'm from, uh, and where you have, you know, spaces where, you know, housing is in a, not affordable, you know, there's not um, the kinds of economic opportunities to have a single family home and this sort of private nuclear family, and that people are experimenting on the smaller scale um, with kind of living communally. And I think that's really quite interesting. Some of that's quite political and some of it's less political um, and mm -hmm. more pragmatic. And so there's, there's that. Uh, and then on the national level, on the kind of policy level, um, there, I mean, I've certainly... I would have been surprised a decade ago with the amount of discussion around Green New Deal, around, you know, having a guaranteed uh, income um, as, as an actual, I mean, I used to teach about guaranteed income 20 years ago, and like, nobody even knew what that was, and that would certainly not be possible, and now it's part of the conversation. So that, that's sort of interesting how some of those policy, those kind of big policy ideas are beginning to um, enter into mainstream political discourse on the more kind of broader way. Um, I'm sort of all over the place on the question of of the internet and, and online, because clearly social media spaces can be so deeply problematic, but people can also find community there. Um, and I, I think that's a real thing. Um, Margaret Atwood and, and there's other intellectuals and thinkers out there who've kind of done utopian experiments online uh, mm -hmm. where they bring people together and people have ideas. And those are really fascinating um, and they definitely generate some interesting stuff. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I think one last question is the idea of third spaces. Is that something that's really yeah. been um, in the air lately? Um, so for those who don't know, third spaces are libraries and coffee shops and bars and, and parks, places where people can kind of come together and get to know each other and create new kinds of community. Um, I think one of the fears is that we're living in a moment, particularly if you're in a high cost city where those kinds of spaces um, are increasingly rare. So I think you mentioned it a little bit that in, in places where you know housing is relatively affordable, um, that community can be created, but I'm wondering about other places. I think there's been a lot of interest recently um, among historians and maybe political scientists as well uh, about the 1970s and the kind of creation of these counter institutions and that that in the in the sort of wake of a lot of the violence and COINTELPRO and so forth of, of the large movements, there was the creation of all of these kinds of third spaces. And you see it in, um, for example, some of the Black nationalist bookstores, uh, feminist bookstores, um, all sorts of co-ops, again, you know, uh, that really flourished and, and created you know, real spaces of safety and conversation that helped to generate things like second wave feminism, um, that helped to generate um, other other movements, the, the, the gay liberation movement, for example. And so I do think I kind of see that there is a, a real interest in the 1970s and that as, 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 as a sort of model for creating those spaces. It is easier to create them in places like Buffalo or Detroit than it is to create them in places like San Francisco. Um, I also think that post COVID, a lot of us really appreciate those kinds of spaces in a new sort of way. I know I still get a thrill a little bit when I sit in a coffee shop uh, with a laptop and you know can be there. Um, so yeah, I think I think that 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 is a that is a really interesting model. It's a very small scale one, 
but it's still really important. Mm. Great, thanks. Um, I think what well, we have a couple more time moments between the just the two of us. Um, I think I really, you know, I think for me, I was fascinated by Father Divine um, and his sort of reach because it, it happened in an area that one doesn't of, of, of New York State that one that one doesn't particularly think is being diverse yet. You know, there, there, there he is, and there are his followers, and and I, I think I'm, I'm just curious about this. He's so well known, and now he's not. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm just sort of curious about how that happens, and I think just in general that these both these utopian movements, but then also the sort of smaller ones like the populist movement mm -hmm. uh, or what have you, they they're really important. Yet they seem to just drop off, a sort of off. Uh, they just sort of drop away, and we don't really remember them. And they aren't, and they and they aren't being used as a way to kind of inspire um, activism today. Yeah, and in the case of Father Divine, I mean, he really gets dismissed as a charlatan, you know, at some point. Um, but he's like covered in all it, not i mean he's covered Af obviously in african american newspapers which are just an incredible and powerful source but also in the new york times um and he's in newsreels you know in the 1930s he's he's famous um and it is sort of remarkable that by the the 50s and 60s his name is already kind of diminishing and there's a, a little bit of an embarrassment about him because he's a charismatic religious leader and he, you know, led a, a movement that, that was economically very successful. He did drive a Rolls Royce or he was driven in a Rolls Royce. So mm -hmm. there's an assumption that he was a kind of charlatan and therefore mm -hmm. a little bit, I think, of an embarrassment about him. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only in more recent years where really, you know, fabulous historians like uh, Judith Westenveld and, and others have gone back and really taken some of these great migration era, new religious movements in the Black mm -hmm. community seriously, mm -hmm. um, including the Nation of Islam and others that people might be more familiar with, uh, where there's been a, this sort of reassessment of the movement and a broader understanding, you know, which I've drawn from and, and hopefully expanded on about how, how successful and powerful um, they were. Um, and it's, it is hard to trace the influence. Um, it's hard to say directly, you know, how that led to something like a piece of legislation. Uh, mm -hmm. But he was, through the work that uh, that the peace mission was doing, they were racially integrated. They were actually engaging in nonviolent direct action and racially mm -hmm. integrating, you know, places of recreation as well as hotels and, mm -hmm. uh, and resorts and things like that. Um, living communally, um, feeding lots of people, uh, spreading this particular powerful message of unity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're absolutely right that that there is a way in which that has, you know, just kind of fallen out, but that's the work of historians. That's, that's what we do. <laughs> right. Right. Um, last question, um, for me at least is, um, if you were to say one thing or maybe a one sentence about the book and what you hoped people would get out of it, what would it be? It would have to be really, again, drawing from Robin Kelly in part, the idea of freedom dreams, the idea of social imagination and dreaming, that the, the human ability to imagine different futures and new futures can help actually enact them and make them, and make them real. Um, and that has happened. It continues to happen. It's not simple. It's not easy. Um, but yeah, that that would be my primary message. Great. Thanks. Um, so I think at this point, we are probably going to open it up. Maybe I'll Great. read a couple of questions from the chat. Um, and I'll, uh, Kurt, are you going to jump in and do this or should I? Well, <clears throat> I think I'll jump in here too. Thank you very okay. much, both of you. I mean, I, I was just going to say a number of the questions kind of touch upon uh, how New Dealers and New Deal programs were influenced, were kind of directly or indirectly influenced by, or how do the, how do the ideas from these uh, yeah. and communal and cooperative programs seep into the New Deal programs and the New Dealers themselves? I know you specifically talk about uh, Henry Wallace and the uh, Farm Security Administration, but uh, could you speak a little bit about more the New Deal uh, 
impact? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think if there's one New Deal administrator who's like the most utopian, <laughs> it would be Henry Wallace, um, certainly with his politics, certainly with his sort of attitudes towards interracialism and race and, and so forth. Um, so both the resettlement administration and then following up from that, the FSA, they um, they actually go and visit the Delta Cooperative Farm, which was this farm in Mississippi. And then there was two farms. There was the Delta one, and then there was a Providence one that was created uh, you know, by this Chris, these Christian left, um, sort of basically intellectuals who took sharecroppers who had been evicted from their farms, both African American and white sharecroppers, um, and created these quite successful cooperative farms. And so, of course, you know, the FSA administrators are going to be interested, and they they go and they visit. Um, and they actually also study utopian communities. Um, they study Oneida and some of the 19th century communities, apparently, as well. That comes up in the congressional testimony. Um, and if, in the end, I do have a couple of notes here. Um, you know, they built, in terms of the cooperative um, communities built by the FSA, I mean, there's over a uh, hundred of them. Um, they housed approximately 10,000 families. 52 of them were fully cooperative um, of these particular communities. They were relatively short-lived uh, and most of them, I should say, were segregated. Uh, as opposed to the Delta and the Providence Cooperative Farms, there were some that had a little bit of a little bit of mixing, but much less so. So, um, so there is a direct relationship there. And I actually have a, a quote that I pulled out from Sherwood Eddy. He used to like to talk about how much better the uh, his cooperative farm was than the government farms. And he said, "Could the government, for instance, under a confessedly capitalist economy?" promote such a cooperative movement as frankly we are doing? Could it officially uphold the Southern Tenant Farmers Worker Union because they actively supported this labor movement, the STFU or any other similar organization? Could it officially organize interracial cooperation with the object of giving equal economic justice to both races? So, you know, he's saying we could go much further because we were independent from the government. But still, the government was, particularly with that particular program, really deeply influenced. And then the other area would just have to be labor more generally, right? Really influenced by the workers' education movement starting in the teens and 20s. And that movement actually dies off partly because organized labor, the CIO, um, takes it up and embraces it and kind of becomes part of the institution of organized labor. So that would be another big area, I would say. Here's another question. Um, uh, one of our audience members asks, are there any utopian groups from the New Deal era that still exist today? And I noted in in your uh, afterward, the um, let's see if I can find it, the, the, um, sc the school, the- The Highlander? Highlander um, yeah. Research Center. Highlander's still around. Um, you know, they were driven out of their uh, original Tennessee home by the Klan uh, and then the state, um, but they still exist and and they're still doing, you know, education work and, and actively involved and, and also really actively involved in, in um, uh, maintaining and educating people of, about the powerful history that they were engaged in, particularly during the 1930s through the 1960s. So they're still around. The Fellowship of Reconciliation is still around. I would say the Christian left still exists. Um, they're still, you know, I've met them in the archives, you know, and met them doing various talks, you know, plenty of Quakers and, and other and radical pacifists out there who are doing really interesting work as well. So there are definitely those kinds of pockets. Here's another question. Um, Fairhope, Alabama. How does Fairhope, Alabama fit in? Its founding predated New Deal and no evidence of interracial efforts. Seems more about economics, single tax. Single tax. Yeah, that's based. So Fairhope, which I've read, I read a really great memoir about Fairhope, and I'm not going to remember the author's name. Um, but it was part of a, a group. There was, you know, other ones, um, but that's probably the best known one based on Henry George's idea of the single tax, which comes out of the late 19th century. Um, and it's a sort of quasi socialist idea uh, and apparently was a pretty remarkable um, community in all sorts of ways. But it did exclude African Americans and it excluded African Americans. This is true of other Southern utopian communities. 
you know, what they said is that it was against the law, you know, it was against the law to have that kind of social mixing, to have, you know, black and white children at the same schools. Um, and, and they didn't want to have undue attention. And I'm here, I'm not excusing them at all, because there are obviously other groups that did do this, but they didn't want the attention, right, um, of white outsiders who are going to maybe come in and, and attack them, which is what happened to many, it's, it's what happened to the Delta and Providence farms. The Klan comes in and breaks them up. It happens to pacifist communes in the South, like Keonia and others. So that was their excuse. But yeah, Fairhope is a, is fascinating. There's once you start looking, there's more of these than you could imagine. Well, I I learned so much from reading your book, Victoria. And the the chapter I just can't stop talking about is the one that you've already touched on, Father Divine. Um, and uh, one of the things I was especially surprised to learn was how in all of those uh, cooperative farms up in the Hudson River Valley, which in itself was just kind of surprising, they kind of moved up there. Um, they were all, they were at their peak, I guess there were 29 of them. They were all led by African-American women, by mm -hmm. black women. Which you know, for at the time, that was kind of kind of remarkable. The the fact that, um, and then you taught you kind of explain that as here were many of these people were from the south. They were not urban people. They were farm people. They knew how to farm. And these women in leadership positions were really kind of empowered and and breaking a lot of of the barriers at the time could you just speak a little bit about that i found that fascinating yeah i mean some you know some historians have referred to the father divine's peace mission peace mission as a black women's movement um the majority of the followers were were black women uh and they were you know attracted for a variety of reasons you know obviously some of those are about religion and belief but also um, these are women who are in this period trapped really only in domestic service in terms of, you know, legitimate employment, which leaves them exploited to sec exposed to sexual abuse and sexual harassment in the workplace. Uh, so they have very few employment opportunities. Um, they are certainly, you know, wanting to be independent, wanting to be economically independent and independent in other ways. And, and African-American migrants, you know, had agricultural skills. They may have spent some time in cities but they usually had grown up in small towns and farms so they knew you know they knew what to do how to raise chickens how to do um, a, a large vegetable garden and sell that produce and use that produce for the big banquets and, and things like that so um, that was very important and in terms of the ideology of the movement men and women were considered um incredibly, you know, entirely equal. And often when they change their names, they would use gender neutral names or even perhaps names of a different gender, or it'd be hard to kind of actually tag them or gender them by their name, which is sort of interesting. Um, and Father Divine preached that God was both male and female, um, and that basically neither race nor gender were real categories. So there is this opportunity for, for a kind of empowerment um, and independence that, I, that, was really, that was really quite powerful. And you, you can read testimonials um, of these women talking about regaining their health, kind of regaining their sense of you know, self and identity that, that can be really, that can be really um, important, yeah. No, thank you. Uh, I have a question for both of you, Kimberly and Victoria. Uh, my colleague, Mary Oaken, asks, uh, given the important and understudied histories this book introduces into the discourse, what further interventions would you like to see in the field of New Deal studies? That's a great question. <laughs> I mean, just to, to follow up on what I was just saying, um, I mean, I think the the role of uh, of gender um, in this era uh, is something that can be can be kind of you know increasingly kind of thought about and elucidated. Uh, and I'm just always interested in the in the bottom up in the grassroots influence. You know, um, there's a lot there's a lot on FDR and his you know his cabinet and that history is important and you know. But often when I read those books, I'm like, where are they getting these ideas from? I mean, they're not just they're not just coming from from you know the ether. They're coming from some places, and they're coming from below usually. So that the more of that, the better. I also I don't 
I don't love the periodization that we have. I don't love like the ways in which the 20th century is completely defined by the wars. Um, so there's the interwar period. And in many ways, I think, you know, the New Deal era has to be seen as going well into the 1940s um, until we really hit the Cold War. So periodization is another thing I get annoyed about. Kimberly, what about you? What do you get annoyed about? Wow, that's such a great question. Um, I think probably I'm, I'm with you on team periodization. Um, uh, I think I would go in the opposite direction in the sense of thinking about many of the policies that get enacted during the New Deal actually come out of the progressive era. Right. Um, so um, AFDC, you know, aid to children, uh, it comes out of, you know, widow's pensions. Um, Social Security comes out of the Townsend old age movement. And so I think that there's, for me, I think it's it's interesting to think about and be attentive to the different kinds of groups. Um, not uh, probably less utopian, but more sort of policy oriented mm -hmm. groups um, that are trying to figure out how do we deal with a, a, a life or a world in which things aren't quite working for them. And so I think that that's important for us. And I think in many ways, I mean, much of what I sort of think about and folks in, in my sort of subfield, we actually think about the ways in which the New Deal has pro proven to be surprisingly durable, both mm -hmm. in terms of policy that, you know, we still have Social Security, however battered, uh, we still have the Social Security uh, program, or um, literally, you can walk around and see this incredible infrastructure um, that we still live with in terms of schools and bridges. Um, and so I think thinking about what it is that enabled this kind of creation um, and can we replicate that? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I love about the Living New Deal um, project is that I was just in Let Letchworth Park and New York State Letchworth Park, uh, which had mm -hmm. major CCC camps. And mm -hmm. so I'm hiking on trails, I'm going across bridges, I'm entering whole buildings that were all built by CCC uh, workers and they're just amazing structures. And I always get like a chill, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're absolutely, mm -hmm. the, the durability, both of the legislation with the exception of the AFDC, um, right. which went away, but um, still the, the durability of both the legislation, but also the physical, the physicality. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, um, we're okay. getting close to uh, wrap up time. We have a couple more minutes. Um, this is a big question, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it. One of our our audience members asks: Did these uh, did the utopian communities that you referenced, Victoria, uh, get involved in partisan politics, uh, running candidates, or were they outside of politics? That's a really important question. Um, many of them, again, um, had anarchist tendencies, so they were did stay somewhat outside of politics. Um, the father, Father Divine talked about being opposed to the New Deal because he didn't believe in welfare. He believed that you should be separate from the state. At the same time, major politicians, um, LaGuardia in New York City tried to gain his favor to get votes. Uh, he did have a, a little bit of a relationship with the Roosevelts as well. So that's sort of interesting. Um, so it really varies. I think um, when it comes to things like the Highlander Folk School or the Workers' Education Movement, those groups were very much tied up with the Democratic Party and trying to pressure them to, to support the labor movement. Um, that's definitely the case. Congress of Racial Equality, those early civil rights radical pacifist groups, they were ambivalent. They were ambivalent even about the double V movement during World War II uh, because they were ambivalent about the state. So there is a, a, a little, a, a bit of a strand of, um, of anarchism there, like the Catholic worker movement, which I don't write about very much, but they're definitely part of this. So there's definitely ambivalence, um, but there are moments, particularly around labor, where they're interacting with the state. Well, thank you. Um, I think we better wrap it up. There's still lots of questions hanging out there, but, um, uh, for those of you in the audience, uh, both Victoria and Kimberly, you can find them at their universities and follow up with your questions. I'm sure they, if if they uh, have the time, they'll respond to you. So I think I'll just wrap it up and say on, on behalf of the Living New Deal team, I want to thank tonight's presenters and thank you to our audience. 
And also thank you, Elizabeth, our tech support person, um, for your interest in the New Deal and your presence here tonight. Uh, please sign up on our website uh, to receive our newsletter and updates and invitations to future programs. We welcome, I just should say this, I'm the development director. We welcome and rely on your tax deductible donations to make our work and programs like this available to everyone. So thank you for your support and thank you for being with us this evening. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.